please start. Uh, Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ritvika Sharma and I'm a senior resident fellow at the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy and I lead Charkha, uh, which is a research center dedicated to constitutional law at Vidhi. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure today to present to you the first in the series of what is going to be a year-long uh, series of conversations uh, on several issues of contemporary relevance under constitutional law. Uh, we've titled the series of Bridges and Breaks, the Constitution at a Crossroads. Uh, the series is being presented to you in collaboration with the India International Center, Delhi. I'm very, very grateful to Mr. K. N. Srivastava, uh, who is the director of the IIC Delhi, for having and for showing such keen interest in conducting the series um, in and around the Constitution. Thank you very much, sir. Um, before we jump into the discussion for today, uh, I'd like to take a few seconds and tell you how the series got conceptualized, what was the inspiration behind this. So it's been more than 70 years since the adoption of the text of the Constitution, and we know well enough that the text has endured and matured uh, based on a vast range of challenges that it has been facing. Uh, nonetheless, uh, many of the predicaments it faces today uh, include old issues that the nation has never quite outgrown. At the same time, we are also facing issues and newer political developments, uh, newer challenges that the Constitution is currently facing. Uh, what we have witnessed in recent years is that social and uh, political developments on almost every front have seen a uh, widespread usage of constitutional language and thought in public discourse. Uh, considering how the last couple of years, if not more, uh, have presented newer and trickier challenges for India's founding document, uh, this seems like a rather opportune moment uh, to talk about everything related to the Constitution. Uh, the avowed aim of this series, uh, which which is going to which which will comprise monthly discussions throughout the year, uh, will be to bring diverse voices and perspectives and facilitate dialogue between these voices uh, and get uh, some inputs on the text of the Constitution. Uh, as well as the text being translated into practice. So we really hope that the series going forward uh, does meet its award aim. And uh, what better to commence this series than a discussion around uh, the pivotal site of democratic participation in India, uh, the elections. Uh, now, as we know, elections in India are often associated uh, with, with a sort of spectacle, a grand event that takes place every couple of years, sometimes uh, in, in a matter of a few months. Uh, the electoral process by itself encompasses much more than just the periodic act of voting and the competition between, between candidates belong to various political parties. Uh, what I would like to talk about in today's discussion uh, are aspects which fall under the vast realm uh, and the vast universe of electoral governance, uh, aspects which touch closely on uh, accountability, transparency, uh, as well as new challenges that lie ahead for the election commission to hold free and fair elections. Um, I would like to thank uh, both our speakers who, uh, Mr. Dr. Niranjan Sarkar is already here with us, Mr. Venkat Chamani, we're still, we still waiting for him, he's, he's occupied uh, in court in a, in a pressing matter and he should be with us in the next few minutes. Uh, but thanks very much, uh, Niranjan, uh, you're here with us today. Thank you very much uh, in helping us kickstart the series and being part of this conversation uh, on electoral democracy in India. Uh, a brief introduction for Dr. Sarkar. Uh, Niranjan Sarkar is a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research and assistant professor at Ashoka University. Uh, he is also a non-resident fellow at the Center for the Advanced Study of India at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Niranjan, your recent work has focused on state-level elections uh, through the prism of both data as well as ethnographic research methods. Um, Niranjan is particularly interested in understanding uh, theoretical principles that, that sort of underpin the decision-making process for voters in India. Uh, thanks very much for participating in this discussion today, uh, Nilanjan. We are very glad to have you. Uh, my gratitude is ob obviously very, very heartfelt because I know you're joining us from a different time zone uh, and you you're at a fairly early hour in the morning. So thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, we'll also have Mr. Venkat Termini with us uh, soon. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, I would uh, want to start with uh, this discussion with you, uh, Nilanjan. Uh, so when I was when I sat down thinking about how to sort of narrow the scope of today's discussion on electoral democracy in India, uh, one of the themes that came to mind is discussing challenges to electoral governance that have persisted since forever, and uh, those are those that have also emerged because of the world that we currently live in—a world that is struck by a pandemic, which obviously has thrown uh, us into several challenges on several fronts. Um, rather fortuitously, at that point, we have this uh, order from the Supreme Court, which came out about three days back, uh, which uh, and this is this is an order which has been uh, given by a three-judge bench uh, with the Chief Justice in it, uh, Justice 
uh, Vineet Saran and Justice Surya Krant, uh, which brought back attention to the existence of crime in electoral politics and the presence of legislators with criminal antecedents uh, in elections these days. Um, so, uh, very briefly, um, I- I'm sure um, uh, we-, we already have um, some knowledge about what sort of uh, an order this is. Um, but um, I'm-, I'm just going to give a brief insight into what this order says. Uh, this is, the bench said that in view of the law laid down by, by the Supreme Court, uh, it is appropriate to direct that no prosecution against a sitting or a former MP or MLE shall be withdrawn without the leave of the particular state high court. So this is this is this is uh, this is perceived to be uh, an order which tries to curb the existence of crime in politics. Um, there are of course pressing questions about what the Supreme Court has done uh, in this regard. There are pressing questions that I would like to ask Mr. Venkat Ramani about what the Election Commission can do here. Uh, but because I have you uh, with me right now, Nilanjan, I would like to ask you something that that sort of has caught my attention uh, since since quite some time now. Now, what the Election Commission can do or cannot do, or more importantly, what it should do, is 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 another discussion. Um, there's one other thing that I would like to bring about right here and. That's the fact that people are now armed with the knowledge of criminal antecedents of uh, politicians. Now, this wasn't true of, let's say, 40 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago. But now, I mean, for someone to give an excuse, they do not know that people who they are possibly voting against do not have some sort of um, criminal antecedents is, is a little hard to believe. And and we, we know that this, is, this has come about based on certain orders given by the Supreme Court itself. Um, yet, after the Lok Sabha Assembly elections, and I'm just... Uh, quoting the uh, statistics from the 2019 General Assembly elections, we saw that around 43% of the winning candidates had some uh, some sort of criminal record against them. Now, to be honest, we shouldn't really be very worried about 43%. Even if it was 4 or 3%, we should have been equally worried. Um, But yes, 43 43 is a huge number that sort of puts puts us in a fix. Uh, this also is a substantial increase in the number of candidates who've had criminal antecedents from uh, the 2009 general elections. Um, so when I was doing my research on this, when I was digging up these numbers, I came across a rather compelling heading in a Times of India piece, and that was uh, MPs with criminal cases, question mark. India's okay with it. Um, and that sort, of, that sort of prompted me to think about it. Um, why, uh, why, why are citizens or why are the voters... Uh, armed with certain knowledge about criminal antecedents, um, what propels them to still vote for a certain candidate despite knowledge of a, of, of a particular criminal act that they have? Um, or maybe the first level question can be, do voters take into account uh, take into account the existence of this information when they go out to vote? Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's- so um, I think I'll save some more broad comments for a little bit later. Um, I think as 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 the uh, second speaker joins, but let me um, let me actually start back one second. You know, with the more general principle in in the kind of question that you've asked. Uh, so even when you read the literature on uh democratic behavior from ancient greece so let's go way back right even there you see a concern that in elections people who are uh eloquent people who are good at duplicity uh people who are wealthier than others are more likely to win elections so you know in some sense the problem that we should see is one that is unfortunately baked into the very idea of electoral democracy. Um, So I want to sort of first disabuse people of the idea that what we see in India today is somehow uh, unusual or not par for the course um, for electoral democracies in general. Now, as you've suggested, what is unique in the Indian context is the the sheer extent of people who have some existing criminal case, a serious criminal case against them. And, um, you know, actually, you know, maybe it is best that I I share um, a couple of things here. Um, Let me just share my screen for a second. Um, You're able to see, uh, hopefully, my screen here right now. Not. Okay. 
Um, so um, I will, you know, maybe um, as a way of sort of discussing this, maybe let me take five to seven minutes about this particular issue, and then I can I can talk about other issues um, as they come up. So, um, you know, I, I I want to sort of start with um, a very very simple idea, right? Which is that. We know that electoral campaigns are very, very expensive. They're very, very difficult to run. And increasingly, they're more expensive and they're more challenging in terms of organizations, right? And the baked in logic that exists in electoral democracy, this, the, the kind of arguments that have been made since uh, you know, the study of Athenian democracy uh, relate to the following idea that in elections, it's not the average person who wins. It's the person who is in some ways the most able to command a large coalition of supporters. However, that person is able to command a large, large coalition of supporters. And so the operative question when we are asking, why is this happening in Indian democracy? And I'm going to be showing you some old data actually, but. The data, uh, as 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 Rituka has, has 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 suggested, is 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 only more extreme today. Um, that uh, you know, people who have criminal backgrounds um, are more likely to win elections, and there's something about people with criminal backgrounds that makes them more winnable in the Indian context, and that's sort of the the, the idea that I want to explore here. Um, so uh, two large questions, um, you know, why do people vote for criminals? Um, if you happen to know that somebody has a criminal case against them, um, why might you A, either not care, or B, uh, why may it uh, not really significantly impact negatively your assessment of the cancer? So the first argument, and this is an argument that is most prominently made by Milan Vaishnav, um, who uh, has written uh, quite a bit on, on criminality in politics and uh, is a, actually a frequent colleague and co-author of mine as well. So I've been following this work quite carefully. Um, he has made uh, the argument that, look, you know, people may not like the sets of behaviors that uh, politicians who engage in criminality bring to the fore. But at the end of the day, if the state is either uneven or unable to provide a certain set of resources, for instance, building roads, schools effectively and efficiently, the fact that you have uh, politicians and you know people with criminal backgrounds who can get these things done, because of how connected they are, because of the number of people that they preside over, um, then they're more likely to uh, vote for that person, right? So the underlying argument here is that an individual uh, is fundamentally or most likely to vote for somebody who is able to distribute, a politician is able to distribute resources towards them. And if somebody with a criminal background is on average more able to do so, as compared to someone without a criminal background, then you should see people disproportionately voting for them. Okay? The other argument, sort of without sort of building in this idea that criminal politicians may or may not deliver uh, at a higher rate, which I will just you know, quickly say in my own empirical work, I think there's mixed evidence for, right? It's not the case that criminal politicians um, are somehow better politicians in terms of economic delivery or, uh, you know, behave, you know, uh, arguing in parliament or some such thing. Um, another argument is that uh, in addition to, uh, you know, whatever skills that, that, that somebody with a criminal background might have, um, they, people who have serious criminal backgrounds, uh, tend to preside over very, very large organizations. And these organizations matter not just for delivery, but also for 
actually just keeping in touch with citizens and voters, right? So during a campaign, they're important because they can help organize um, campaigns. And as I said, um, I'm particularly focused on, 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 on who's able to bring in resources during a campaign. But even between elections, they're able to uh, interact with citizens, right? In a way that um, uh, you know the average person cannot do so, right? And this is because somebody with a criminal background necessarily res uh, presides over uh, um, uh, an organization that has a logic, right? People who do things for them, contractors, so on and so forth. Um, the third thing, which uh, you know, uh, Mill and Vishnu actually covers quite significantly, is that. Most people with criminal backgrounds tend to be very, very rich, and that I'm going to talk about here in a second. Um, and in fact, in my own work, um, I do find that actually more than criminality, criminality matters a lot, uh, but actually money is the thing that matters the most, right? And so just very quickly, um, let me just talk about why that is, um, and then I'll just show you a couple of couple of images to sort of bolster the point. Um, so India in this way is very, very peculiar. Um, you know, in most systems, uh, the MLA, right, the person that you are voting for, or the MP, right, the member of parliament, member of legislative uh, assembly, is somebody that you uh, care about a lot more because that person has significant policymaking power. In India, there's been a certain kind of political retrenchment, right? There is low intra-party democracy. So today, no matter which party you're talking about, right? It can be the national parties, BJP Congress, it can be state level parties. An individual candidate who wants to run for office has no power over whether she or he gets a ticket and has no power over where she or he will contest the election, right? Now, the reason why that's important from the perspective of financing or electoral financing is that in most systems, for instance, the United States and other places with very, very expensive elections, people uh, have residential requirements. More often than not, an incumbent who runs more than 90% of the time will win. In India, you actually have only about 50% of the time, uh, less than 50% of the time, in fact, an incumbent who uh, runs will win. And there's some stability to where an individual runs. And because elections are uh, contested through primaries, so even the stage of getting a party ticket is not the decision of a party leader, but it's a decision of the electorate at large. Uh, these individual candidates actually start building up their name within a constituency and start building a war chest from outside funding within a constituency, right? So there's a lot of third party money because I know exactly from where a candidate will contest, and I want to invest in a candidate who's going to win because some policy benefits might come to me. Now switch to the Indian context. I don't know if this person is going to get a party ticket because all of that just depends on Amit Shah or Mamta Banerjee or Naveen Patnaik, right? Um, I don't know if that person gets a party ticket from where she or he will contest. So uh, what's the point of investing in this person, right? Actually, I should rather invest in the party or give, you know, pay into electoral bonds, right? So candidates themselves are not really able to command outside resources around electoral politics. And this is why being independently wealthy, being self-financing is so important. When you cannot build a war chest, you have to use your own money to uh, finance um, a, a, a campaign and certain set of electoral activity. The second thing I want to talk about very quickly, um, we know that constitutionally India um, has um, an anti-defection law um, in, in most contexts, right? So, so individual politicians cannot vote against their party. Most resource distribution on public benefits are either coming directly from the center or from the state government. So they're, they're not really able to decide the distribution of benefits in a serious way. So you are neither able to vote against your party, nor do you actually have serious command over the large big ticket items in, pub in public benefits. 
So this means that actually in terms of policy making power, Indian politicians, individual politicians, MLAs and MPs have remarkably little power. Now, that means that politicians can be interchangeable, they can get new tickets, they can be reelected. Uh, you know, th more often than not, uh, the average citizen is voting for, um, you know, Shivraj or Mamta or Naveen Patnaik and not the individual MLA or MP. And we have a lot of empirical evidence of that. And so you have very little policy making power. You're likely to not get a ticket over and over and over again. Most, uh, uh, most politicians in parliament are first time politicians, right? Um, so when you have this very, very low tenure, you have no policy making power, um, you are more likely to see entry into politics as a business proposition, right? Certain benefits that I can make in terms of corruption or in terms of contracts for my friends or for me. Um, and so that all plays into this idea that people with certain kinds of backgrounds are much, much more likely to want to enter into politics because in some sense you have no other incentive to do so other than a very, very small group of people unless you explicitly see it as an investment opportunity. So just very quickly, I just want to show you the, the graphs. Again, this is data up through 2009. This is from a book that Milan Vishnu has written, uh, When Crime Pays. And you can see that even when you break down the probability of winning, people who have uh, one case and at, uh, one serious case um, uh, are, are actually much, much more likely to win the election. And that's consistent with some of the arguments that I've talked about here. And uh, you, know, you can see that um, it is indeed uh, those candidates um, who uh, you know that there's a, there's sort of a strong relationship between um, candidates who um, are wealthy and have criminal cases against them, right? So there's a strong relationship in Indian electoral politics between the existence of criminal cases and just being wealthy, right? And that's for some of the reasons that we've talked about. Um, and this is some, from some of my own work um, in 2018 in an in a edited volume called Costs of Democracy. Um, some of these graphs are complicated, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through them. Uh, the book is edited by Devesh Kapoor and Milan Vishnav. And um, you know, so I have a chapter on self-financing candidates. And here I'm looking from 2004 to 2014. Uh, what I want to show, so I've broken uh, down the data for using affidavits, uh, which is, you know, questionable in various ways. Um, the declared movable assets of a candidate and total assets. So basically non-property wealth and non-property plus property wealth. First thing is that you can see that wealth is growing exponentially. This is wealth in lakhs, right? For the median candidate. The second thing that you can see, so whether I look in movable assets or, 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 or non-movable assets. The second thing, and this is important, right? So NC and C refers to non-competitive candidates and competitive candidates, right? So candidates who are, uh, you know, competing for third parties or as independents, and candidates who are competing for one of the top two constituencies, uh, parties in the constituency. What you can see is even before we look at winning, the most competitive parties, right? So let's take, you know, a state like Madhya Pradesh, right? Top two parties are Congress and BJP in almost every constituency, BSP and some others, right? Um, in those top two parties, uh, the average wealth of candidates is way higher than the average wealth of candidates not competing for those two parties. So it gives you an idea that it's an arms race, right? And that we do care about self-financing candidates. Can, uh, parties, very competitive parties, require very, very wealthy candidates in order to win the election. And a final graph here, and this is just sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, making the, the final point is that even once I control for how competitive a candidate is, so if I just take the top two candidates in the constituency, even there you see the wealthier candidate. This is the probability. These bands are uncertainty. 
the probability that a wealthier candidate uh, wins and the probability that the least, less wealthy candidate wins, right, out of the top two candidates in the constituency. And you can see that even conditional on being competitive, wealth actually gives you an advantage in winning the election. Okay. So um, I'm going to leave my comments here. Um, but, um, you know, this is just to say that, you know, there is this sort of strong connection between criminality and wealth. And there's an internal logic for why it is that voters would support criminals, irrespective of whether one knows that criminal cases exist or don't exist um, uh, uh, for a candidate. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Neelanjan, for your thoughts on this. Um, the way you've explained this with, with some very helpful numbers and the nexus between criminality, money, uh, how that potentially affects um, in, participation of candidates in an election, how that potentially also affects voter behavior. I think that that, that, that makes for a, for a, for a great um, discussion after this. I do have certain follow-up questions with you, but before that, um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Uh, Venkat Ramani here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I know you've had a, a rather busy day at court, and thank you so much for joining. Um, by uh, means of a quick introduction for you, um, we have with us uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani, who's a senior advocate uh, in the Supreme Court of India. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Crazy. You're on mute, sir. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we are not muted. No, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? No, now I can, sir. Now I can. Hmm. Yes. I said, can you skip that introduction? <laughs> sure, sir. Sure, sir. If, if that's fine, uh, I, 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 that's perfectly fine. If you want to just jump in with, with your thoughts on this. Uh, uh, I do want to lay out some context uh, for what we're going to talk about. Before that, I completely skipped uh, mentioning that uh, thanks a lot for all those, for all our attendees and the members of the audience today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I encourage you to ask uh, and type out your questions in the chat box. And uh, once we have uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani's thoughts in, possibly we can have a moderated Q&A and then we can open the floor, uh, open the chat box uh, for for a Q&A with the members of the audience. Um, Mr. Venkat, I'm only then because I'll, I'll skip the introduction and sort of jump right into it. Uh, before uh, before I um, started our discussion with Nilanjan, I was just mentioning that while I was narrowing down this discussion, um, uh, points for discussion today, uh, rather fortuitously, we had this order from the Supreme Court about three days back. Um, uh, this Chief Justice bench uh, that spoke on um, how, how if, no prosecution against sitting or former MLA or MP can be withdrawn without the leave of the High Court, uh, without the leave of the High Court under uh, Section 321 of the CRPC, which which took me back uh, to uh, questions around uh, the existence of crime in politics and the existence of crime in elections. Um, Niranjan has very helpful said the context for that, uh, and he's spoken about the nexus between crime, politics, uh, and money. Um, so I, I, I would like some thoughts from you generally on on uh, the institution of, of the election commission and uh, the existence of crime and politics. So so we've known for, for quite some while, sir, that the Supreme Court has passed several orders in several cases. I'm not just talking about the recent order, but orders passed since, uh, let's say, ADR, the ADR judgment in 2002 and the PUCL judgment in 2003, which has spoken extensively about publishing information uh, on criminal antecedents of uh, sitting legislators, of people who are potentially going to contest in elections. Um, um, and this is, as I said, this is certainly not the first time that a lot uh, in, in, the, in the area of uh, curbing crime in politics and electoral politics has happened by means of judicial innovation in the realm of uh, the right to information of citizens to know, and uh, possibly also in the realm of disqualification of candidates. Um, I would like, I, I want to turn the attention of you as well as our audience members to the institution of the election commission and what, what sort of role it can potentially play uh, in, in keeping criminalization in check. Uh, I'm going to borrow some words from the Supreme Court, not my words, but, but the, the Supreme Court's uh, words in a 1978 judgment where it said that Article 324, uh, which, which establishes the election commission, is a reservoir of power to act for the avowed purpose of uh, pushing forward in free and uh, fair election with expedition. So now that electoral politics in India is tangibly criminalized is sort of a platitude, we've heard that far too many times. Um, 
so would i would like to have your thoughts on uh, the role that the eci has been playing uh, in so far as curbing or keeping criminalization in check is concerned considering that it has this vast reservoir of powers um is the eci sort of doing enough or is there some more distance it can travel uh, while uh, talking of criminalization in politics what would your thoughts on that be sir this question of whether an institution is doing enough is a question which is must be legitimately asked in respect of every institution of government including courts are the courts doing enough are the governments doing enough right so when you talk of the enough question comes in because there are certain assumptions that public institutions within a constitutional framework and those persons who compose the institutions are uh, expected to be one altruist absolute moralist then people who look forward with certain visions and would not be probably dragged behind by any other narrow partisan other selfish considerations so where do we have this kind of people sitting in governance or in any institution but as we move from one institution to another we have different degrees of expectations and scales of conformity with high standards of behavior so when you talk of the court we put it to the highest level because that's where the ultimate understanding of what the constitution and the law means must come and therefore we expect a highest level of competence the intelligence the understanding integrity and a forward looking perspective but when it comes to other institutions you can't probably expect the same kind of uh, you know criteria norms but as i said uh, ultimately we are talking about people who are manning the institutions and our assumptions about the institutions are sometimes hugely idealistic and uh, therefore well, let's keep that in mind and when the constitution thought about the election commission and giving it a, a, a certain uh, framework to act in article 324 probably even the constitution framework did not conceive or in the side that the election commission will begin to play a role not merely after the parliament has done what is required to be done in terms of the functions of the election commission but in terms of what it perceive as a as a called a, a so motto or expansion of its own understanding of functions and to what extent the election commission can draw from the reservoir of article 324 to ensure free and fair elections will be a big question probably the election commission could not have uh, amended the representation of people act by issuing any regulations therefore there is a there is a parliamentary law which would be a facilitating instrument or tool for the election commission and wherever and within the parliamentary law or in the fringes of the parliamentary law where there are certain gray areas which can be filled up by the election commission acting you know by what called supplying the omissions the deficiencies that's a different aspect altogether therefore i think when we talk of acting in our you know we must have all these things in mind so when as soon as supreme court of india began to think of the election commission as having a sufficient of the wire of power under article 324 it is only to invigorate the election commission but it could not have converted the election commission into a primary law making body on very substantive issues so it's uh, on the one hand like law there are a large number of institutions under any law where they can frame subordinate legislation regulation rules bylaws so on and so forth so the election commission's uh, 324 reservoir is like that so within the framework of the law what it can do to further the object of the law and you know and and ensure that the law works in a more expansive way so ultimately i think as a as a member of the law commission i understand that every law leaves sufficient room open for the players within the law to make it really workable so their understanding their visions their perspectives may you know make an Im- immense contribution to the framework of the law for so there is a there is a combination of how you uh, execute and operate the law 
and your understanding of the law and the bad skeletons of the law. So these are, these are things which one must keep in mind. Having said all that, I think the Election Commission has over a period of time has been endeavouring to ensure that its duty to fill up all these gaps within the framework of law and the, you know, and the enormous expectations which the Election Commission is called upon to discharge. I think it has done it to a large extent, but uh, if you are talking about uh, again this uh, very uh, debatable area where the Election Commission could have passed uh, controversial orders, I think let's not look into those aspects today. Any institution can commit error for good or bad reasons and they are open to criticism and they are open to correction, either through the political process or the parliamentary process or in the hands of the court. We are not looking at those areas where the institution can commit errors within the law. We are looking at the, the possibility of the institution expand, you know, expansively looking at the law and making it work in a more realistic way. If you look at it like that, I think Election Commission has done a reasonably good job. Now, just to share with you, in, you are talking about the recent order passed by the Supreme Court, the, uh, the 244th report of the Law Commission. And uh, I had prepared a concept note for the commission at that point of time. And uh, I was very clear in my mind that unless politics is completely cleared of the criminal dimension, question of a free and fair election from a wide perspective will continue to be a, a debatable issue. And therefore, I said there is a need for amendment of certain provisions of the Representation of People Act and no political party. And today, let us look at it like this. If you look at South Africa, there, there is a recent legislation uh, which uh, talks about uh, you know, electional funding, political party funding, limitations, restrictions, who will fund, who will not fund, all those issues. Uh, USA has been talking about it for quite a long time. And UK has a very minimal kind of a regulatory framework. Japan is talking about its funding, public funding, private funding. So Japan is a very classic example where the private funding and a public funding can come closer to even, uh, you know, what called a lobby is coming into the funding issues and, and probably you can jeopardize a, a free and a fair election or even, or even a free democratic process. So let us look at the global level and find out what is really happening to ensure one, that the political process of elections is really free and fair from the point of view of, uh, I'm not talking about the criminalization, from the point of view of how the private and the public wealth, which is not uh, exposed to public scrutiny, will play a part in the free and fair elections part of it. If you were able to deal with that, we would have made the next important step towards making it free and fair. But you're talking about criminalization, I think, is intimately connected with this issue. Because who, what kind of person with what kind of criminal background would like to become part of the political process? So that takes me to a very important question. Now, today, there is no law governing the conduct, the formation, the conduct of political parties, except to a minimal extent about the income tax returns. I think that hardly any solace. Therefore, as long as the conduct of political parties in the choice of their you know, candidates and in what manner the candidates' discipline in, regarding, in regard to compliance with the constitution and law is ensured, by the internal process of the political parties itself. So there, I think there is a huge gap and a huge deficiency. And I must put, a, put on record that the Law Commission called for uh, discussions and debates on the Representation of People Act Amendment. Not one political party supported the proposition that persons, even when they are called upon or you know, a charge is framed or an FIR is lodged, even at that stage, somebody should step out of the electoral process or was a suggestion given by the law commission. Not one political party supported this proposition. That means what? Today, political parties to a large extent probably have a warrior element in them. I call it, you know, for a certain reason, a warrior element. These warrior elements probably you find even in religion. So if the warrior elements are in the political parties, are they required? Are they needed? Political parties, can they not stand on their own moral and ethical strength, on the, on, the, on the strength of what principles and policies need to be framed and enforced? 
or do we still need this kind of an worry relevant to sustain the political party in the bitter struggle of the political process? So all these issues are there. It is therefore, see, in the past couple of years, the bitter struggle between or a contest between political parties at different levels and whether in the, in, in the heat of elections or otherwise. So the political parties as an institution, to what extent can they be regulated by law, subjected to law, and scrutinized by law, are all very important questions. So perhaps uh, we we'll look at it from a larger angle. And let us not look at them in isolation. Totally, sir. Totally, sir. No, that's um, there's actually very interesting points, and the bit that you mentioned about regulation in political parties. Uh, in fact, only uh, if, while while sort of doing the groundwork for this panel, I was reading about uh, how how empowered the election commission is insofar as registration or deregistration, um, not registration, but yeah, deregistration of political parties might be concerned. Political parties that might be um, uh, that might uh, have, and it's not just about parties that have elements of criminality in them. But certainly, uh, parties that may have uh, taken up um, uh, measures during during a particular election campaign that are clearly uh, not uh, not not in in compliance with the law. Um, I, I do uh, get your thoughts on on the election commission, sir. But I do have one follow up question, just on 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 the on the institution of the election commission as such, and maybe then we can uh, move on to up, uh, other other aspects. So, sir, you particularly mentioned that um, uh, when when the constituent assembly debates were were uh, considering over mulling the election commission, they possibly did not anticipate challenges that lay ahead of it uh, now. Um, clearly, COVID-19 was a challenge that nobody anticipated would ever lie ahead of us, uh, rather unfortunately. Um, so, particularly in the last in the last couple of months, and right uh, before the second wave struck, we had we had we had several uh, state assembly elections. Post uh, the second wave, of whatever happened, the, the election commission. Uh, unfortunately invited a lot of sharp comments from certain state high courts as well um now um just just two uh, two follow up questions on that the first level question would be um has has the conduct of the election commission as such uh, has has um, in in recent times has that uh, changed public perception of the election commission does the public think differently about the election commission uh, now is it not the venerated body anymore i mean i, I i'm i'm sure i'm going several steps ahead and saying that but uh, has the public perception gotten altered uh, the second question and i know like there are there are no easy answers to that so election commission is supposed to be the watchdog for elections in this country but should we also think about uh, how to watch the watchdog? Should we think about holding the election commission accountable and asking certain pressing questions of, of the institution itself? Any thoughts on that, sir? And, and I'm not just talking about its conduct during COVID-19. While the question is premised in COVID-19, I'm also talking of misgivings in electoral results in the last few years. Um, if there have been uh, issues around missing out of names in electoral rules. So should we think generally about how to watch the watchdog? See, we must have some realistic understanding of performance of institutions who have such huge responsibilities. We expect that no what called sharp edge of the political or the governance process will uh, what called bring these institutions into disrepute. I, I don't know whether we can have any such ideal situation. Of course, the, the, the desire is, the wish is that we should move towards such ideal situation when all institutions will be free from any external perseverations or influences. And what we have seen in the past couple of years were serious questions about the election commission's uh, lack of neutrality or impartiality or passing some orders and directions which doesn't seem to be in accordance with the highest, let's say, the highest level of the ethics of an institution. You may put it like that. Because after all, we are all talking about the ethics of an institution. And that flows not only from the framework of a law, but from the conventions, the principles, and certain underlying ideas which uh, uh, people who mind the institutions will have to ever keep in mind. Therefore, on the one hand, certainly, if the institution falls uh, falls uh, low in 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 the standards of uh, its performance in respect of a few areas of uh, of its functioning, such as for instance, uh, I, I hear 
what happened in Assam in case of somebody who was granted a relaxation on the ban. So same thing was not done in case of Mr. Raja in, in Tamil Nadu, in DMK, and not certainly in West Bengal. Maybe these are very serious questions for the Election Commission to answer. And uh, there are a lot of write-ups in uh, columns, in newspaper columns about uh, how Election Commission strips somewhere very seriously. But these are these are the issues where perhaps you're talking about how to do who will watch the watchdog. It's like the, who will uh, keep a watch on the fence, right? There's something very old about all institutions. I don't think uh, we need yet another law in this regard. The current representation of political party, uh, representation of people act can probably add some dimensions where the accountability of the election commission can be more explicitly stated. But there is a there is a problem there. I'll tell you why. When we're discussing this issue of criminalization of politics and the candidates' criminal antecedents, what is often said is there can be false prosecutions, and how do we really keep a track on this falsity of prosecutions? Well, if you cannot avoid false prosecutions, we expect candidates who will not uh, probably fall in that trap of even such false prosecutions. One can always see a distinction between prosecutions which are, you know, plainly false and fraudulent. And those prosecutions where somebody is actually involved, we can draw this distinction without any difficulty. So the law can bring in those distinctions in the same on the same lines. I think if there is, if at all there is a need, if at all, then accountability of election commission can be subject to some kind of a supervision by the Supreme Court. But I am a little worried that the moment you bring in any amount of accountability within the strict framework of a law. There'll be too much of demands, and there'll be too much of what called divisive political litigation and strategies, which can also bring a lot of strain on the election commission. So today, given the kind of a uh, very intense, animate political process, where a lot of things are happening for different kinds of reasons, I don't wish to go into that. So there are too many things which are happening because the political parties are embroiled in conflicts on a wide range of issues, not necessarily in regard to governance, on a wide range of issues, history, culture, religion, you name any one of them. So therefore, there could be a possibility that the moment the election commission is brought within the scope of any, any uh, strict standard of accountability within, uh, again, uh, the scope of a uh, framework of a law, there could be some issues. But I suppose it's better that uh, uh, every deviation from high standards of conduct is uh, now open to public criticism as much as possible. And secondly, let the Supreme Court, which is available there for such corrections, can look into it and do some correctional remedial measures. Let us not uh, make it too rigid for the Election Commission to function. That will be my takeaway from this. So probably, as I said, if we are able to get into grappling with the issues of criminalization in a more structured way, then funding of the electoral process in a structured way, perhaps the reasons of the occasion for the election commission to be a deviant would also probably come down to a large extent. That's how I look at it. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, sir. And I think that sort of ties in really well with what Nilanjan was also mentioning in the beginning about all the issues of criminality, uh, electoral finance, money in uh, elections, uh, and, and how that sort of masks the electoral governance and electoral process um, in itself. Nilanjan, one, one question for you, and this is because I just spoke of COVID a few minutes back. Um, uh, and we, we, we've had one, uh, we, we've had several actually, we've had several elections um, uh, in the country, several state assembly elections in the country after COVID struck. And there was one right before um, COVID struck, which is, which is uh, if I recall correctly, which is Delhi in February 2020. Um, oh, just, just out of intrigue, um, since so many state assembly elections have now happened, have voters priorities as well as voting patterns, have they undergone a change in a world still coming to terms with the pandemic? Uh, in other words, like what, what are voters uh, now wanting to hold their uh, legislators or their representatives accountable for? Have, has that undergone a change? Hmm. So, uh, so uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, you know, I, I, I think the 
trying to figure out what voters actually want is obviously a very, very difficult question. Um, the underlying assumption in most thinking of voter behavior is actually what voters want is fairly straightforward. Either some notion of economic delivery or perhaps I, you know, as, as a voter, I am committed to an individual or to a party. Most of these other kinds of issues we tend to, uh, you know, maybe we don't have great empirical evidence uh, that they matter, right? So let's, let's take COVID, for example, right? I mean, it's not clear based on the pattern of uh, results that um, COVID hitting in a pretty big way during this last round of elections actually affected electoral results at all. People ask about West Bengal, but in West Bengal, essentially the BJP was swept in every phase of the election before or after um, uh, you know, the COVID, hit, the, the worst of the COVID wave hit. Um, it's true that the BJP really did not do well after the COVID wave hit, but that was in and around Calcutta where the BJP was not going to do well anyway. Uh, but you look at a state like Assam where in principle, those questions should have come to the fore, but uh, questions of political polarization, um, you know, sort of other issues within Assam seem to dominate during the election. And, and, and I think that that's probably what one would find. The only sort of quick comment I would make here, I mean, I, I, I could make much more detailed comments about what um, voters care about, is that, look, the way that a political scientist thinks about this problem is ultimately when something goes wrong, let's say COVID management, to whom do I uh, apportion blame, right? Yeah. So this is a very, very difficult problem, right? Because let's take Delhi, right? Um, you know, city where, where all of us <laughs> live. Uh, who do you blame? Do you blame Kedriwal? Do you blame Modi and Amit Shah? Do you blame the bureaucracy? Do you blame, um, you know, healthcare providers? Do you blame the military, right? So the inability to easily apportion blame for a voter is the first problem. And the second uh, problem is, you know, we have very, very different assessments. If I go to somebody who is a core BJP Modi supporter and say who was to blame for what happened in Delhi, they'll say Kijua. If I go to a core Aam Aadmi uh, party supporter and ask the same question, they'll say Modi and Amit Shah, right? So the fact that people have partisan biases in their assessment of the world around them, right? Uh, creates huge problems in creating a single narrative uh, for how an issue translates into politics. Yeah. Um, I think very quickly, I would just also like to say that um, the COVID management issue vis-a-vis -vis elections, at least, is a, is, a, is a bit more complicated. This ties to the question that you were asking earlier, right? Um, you know, um, when we think about how one should institutionally respond during an election. We also have to think about the wisdom of the election commission actually having full control over uh, policing powers in general, right? So, you know, COVID is a good example. When you have emergencies that, that occur during election time on matters that have nothing to do with elections, then who has policing and juridical powers becomes quite complicated, right? Um, and when we think a little bit about institutional design vis-a-vis -vis elections, electoral commission, during something like COVID, which is of course once in a lifetime event, uh, but any kind of disaster situation, any kind of unintended situation, the Indian system has geared towards creating one institution that essentially has unquestionable powers, as opposed to a situation in which there's an explicit uh, model of checks and balances during an election, right? Um, and that has certain implications because, you know, just before the um, election that we, the elections that we saw in India, we saw a US election where the president was trying to manipulate the results. And the American system, which has political appointees that are decentralized, held out pretty well against that pressure. And I think there's a question and questions that were raised already in this in this panel that 
would the Indian system be able to hold out against that kind of pressure? Yeah. Right? And that really sort of highlights the differences between a checks and balances approach and, shall we say, concentration of power approach that exists in India. That's very, that's very helpful, uh, Niranjan. And this, this sort of, uh, when you spoke about accountability and, and, and the sort of confusion voter, voters have, not confusion, but yeah, the, the, the underlying questions on who to hold accountable, that sort of propels me to ask you one other question. I know that this might this might merit a very a longer response, but if you have some quick thoughts on any discernible differences in um, in, in voter behavior or just generally in, in voting patterns, uh, when you're talking of elections to at, at the national level and when we are talking to uh, talking about elections at a more localized level. And when I say localized here, I'm referring to both local governments as in the third tier, as well as state assembly elections. So are there any discernible differences? And I'm not talking in a COVID um, in, in, in a COVID situation. I'm generally talking of uh, voting preferences in such a situation. Uh, just any quick thoughts on that? So let me just, uh, yeah, let me just, you know, in two minutes, let me let me uh, make a distinction between elections in the third tier and state elections. So mm -hmm. I think that we have seen um, an increasing distinction between um, how um, voters uh, perceive national elections. I'll just show you one graph here. Um, how voters perceive national elections and how voters perceive um, state elections, right? And and we can kind of see here that, you know, if we take the most recent elections in and around the 2019 elections, we're talking about, this doesn't include the most recent round of elections where we see similar results. We see double digit differences in BJP vote share, right? Um, between the national election and the state election. This tells you that voters are actually thinking about state elections and national elections um, quite differently. Why is this increasing gap happening between national and state elections? It is a matter of debate. Um, my answer has actually been that um, we have very, very strong centralizing tendencies within the BJP today, right? And actually the biggest uh, loser in that is a state level leader within the BJP. So in the past, if I were, let's say I was in Madhya Pradesh, or if I were in Ch Chhattisgarh, right? The credit for welfare schemes was going to the chief minister, Shivraj or Raman Singh, right? Uh, today, that credit is going to Modi and Amit Shah or Modi, right? And so overnight, a state level leader within the BJP has lost his or her core appeal. And this is creating sort of very strong fluctuations in the BJP's vote share in, uh, as compared to how the BJP performed before Modi came on the scene. Um, so I think that, you know, today we're seeing very, very strong differences uh, in how uh, voters are perceiving the BJP in national and state elections explicitly due to the kind of centralization we're seeing in political messaging and also centralization within the political party, right? Um, so that's, you know, one uh, very obvious trend I think that we've seen. We have a few different reasons for why that might be happening. Um, you know, in terms of the third tier, look, you know, it's complicated. Uh, it is not run by the election commission, as you know. Um, there's a question about how much uh, um, fairness there is. What I'll say is there, that you have two two trends, right? You have a certain kind, uh, you have a certain trend of local political leaders who are uh, have independent sources of power, caste, family name, so on and so forth, right? Certainly in villages, but also in urban politics. Um, but you also have um, a certain partisan pressure that exists. So you will often see, and we've seen this most recently in UP, uh, but of course people have talked about West Bengal, Tripura, a lot of these elections go uncontested. Often the party that's in power is able to manipulate local elections in their favor. And that actually has something to do with the functioning of schemes. Five o'clock. Right? right? Um, yeah. so, so that's, uh, you know, that's what I would say that that, you know, third tier is a little more complicated because a, a lot of times um, alignment between the local tier and the state and national government is actually quite uh, relevant for the delivery of schemes, which is why you see that kind of manipulation in the third tier. Um, so, Right. 
that's that's actually very helpful. Those are rather rather sobering thoughts that you've given us. Oh, when you showed the graph to us, um, uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani, I would like to come to you. And uh, this is also a, a question that's uh, come from uh, one of our members in the uh, in the audience. And uh, this is particularly about um, postal ballots and uh, what does the future hold in store for them? Uh, particularly again, and now that mobility might get reduced because of because of um, COVID nineteen and because because but moving around for voting in a particular person's home state or wherever they're registered to vote is obviously going to get possibly uh, might become tougher in the in the, in the days to come. So while we do know postal ballot balloting does exist in some form already, do you think the time for it has already come where we open this up to population um, irrespective of their age or irrespective of their particular um, how, how they're placed uh, geographically? Do you think the time for this has come fully now? I think so, but I think given the uh, assistance of technology developments, we can probably go a little beyond the traditional understanding of a postal ballot. Yes. That's right. I think it's important because the, the migration pattern, the challenges in employment opportunities and the way the whole uh, called movement of people from one part of the country to the other part and several uh, and what called unanswered questions about people's locations, identity, place of work, a lot of questions. Therefore, it's important that we need, we need to move in this direction a uh, little more clearly so that people do not uh, lose the, the right to you know, have a person of their own choice governing their affairs. I think it's very important. I agree with you. Uh, you know, just, just, uh, I'm, I'm so yeah, sorry. Please, sorry. please go ahead. Yeah. Um, just, just as a follow-up question, this is uh, this is some mostly out of intrigue. Uh, is, is postal balloting or uh, uh, voting uh, remotely is has it taken sort of ground in other jurisdictions? And I'm not talking of jurisdictions in the West, but more comparable jurisdictions uh, when you would like to compare them with India. Um, uh, has that sort of taken off ground? Uh, so I, I have to be honest. I'm not. I'm not completely sure. Um, I, mm -hmm. I suspect so, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, you know the pressures for postal ballots are common across systems right i mean i i, I think that ultimately um unless you have a model in where you genuinely believe that the people voting are fixed in their residence you're going to have to solve the postal ballot problem um so so uh you know while i you know i don't know the specifics of uh, some of these other countries uh on postal ballot law at least um I can say that the pressures are 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 are, are quite common, and and and, and I, I I agree with uh, you know what's been said here that that you know, ultimately it's a it's a direction that needs to be looked into, um, particularly as you know look we are still in a pandemic world we don't know what's going to happen right uh, in yeah. the next year year and a half and um, having uh, that idea for whatever calamities may come either COVID or in the future not just the next one and a half years is also, I think, a smart decision for any kind of electoral system. Right. Um, just before I close this discussion, there's just one other question in the uh, question box. Uh, and, and I would like to put that to, uh, to both my speakers here today. Um, uh, so trying to tie up uh, all that we have discussed today about accountability, transparency in elections, and um, how, how an institution can play a good, uh, a sort of very important role over here. We have a question from the audience asking what potentially can the media do to also ensure transparency and accountability in the electoral process. So uh, um, any, any thoughts, uh, uh, and I, I open this question to both of you. Uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani, would you like to answer this first uh, on the question on how the media can potentially play a, 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 more, a more helpful role? was what it need to do. I, I, I don't think they need any teachers. But uh, yeah. what what is sometimes uh, important is, uh, I in the context of freedom of speech and expression, there's an interesting proposition which has been working in my mind once I came across it. It's like this. So I have a right to express myself as a human being and as a citizen of a country. And then what means do I you know, invent for this kind of freedom of expression. So in a period of time, as many tools and instruments we invent are able to develop for expressing oneself, these instruments themselves become more important, sometimes more important than 
the freedom of speech and expression itself. Therefore, press comes in that category of a tool and instrument which has become more important than what one would desire or be inclined to talk. So social media is an excellent example. So social media is an unowned territory. Nobody has an ownership on that. Therefore, nobody has an accountability there. But I suppose where the owned part of the media is certainly subject to a lot of legal and other restrictions. They know what they need to do. I don't think they need to be told what they need to do. But what probably given uh, again an intensely conflict ridden social and political process there is nothing like a neutral media sector. Mm -hmm. So if somewhere an historian made this observation, somebody can be objective but cannot be necessarily neutral. So neutrality, objectivity is not necessarily neutrality. So but these dimensions, if somewhere they kept in mind, the highest level of exchange of views and perspective would probably add to what called the elimination of again those kind uh, areas where people are unnecessarily quarreling. So you pick up a statement or a word or expression made somewhere and the media reports somewhere in a, in a particular way and that becomes a, a ball rolling exercise. And that's where mm -hmm. I think the, the, the neutrality part of it, the objectivity part of it, which are fundamental pillars of the media, I think if they are a little more closely looked at, well, there will be a lot of uh, enrichment in the entire process. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything uh, that has been said here. I mean, I think the, the only thing that I would add to this is that, you know, unfortunately, I think it is the case that at least the loudest media is responding to certain incentives that exist in the system for ratings, for uh, support, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and that's perhaps why people ask questions about uh, what the media can do during elections. I mean, I can give you a very simple example. I spent two and a half weeks in Assam and West Bengal, and it was totally apparent what was going to happen in both of those states. Um, but you wouldn't know it from hearing the news. Um, you know, it's sort of bizarre, actually. Um, and, and and so I, I, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, when we ask for the media to be impartial in some sense, um, it's also we're asking the media to not respond to certain incentives it has for financing itself, for gaining support with certain parties, for uh, gaining higher ratings, so on and so forth, uh, which I think is, is is probably not 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 plausible. Um, I think the other problem we have today with with a lot of media is that increasingly people will tune into media that supports their own views, um, yes. and so the idea that you can have um, a media that uh, broadly informs citizens across all sides in a very polarized environment um, is 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 becoming uh, difficult. What I would say, uh, you know, as as you know, sort of a counterpoint to all of this is that there is always going to be a role for some version of independent media that continues to highlight in as objective as I said objective but maybe not neutral a manner um, as to what is happening even if it is not currying favor with anyone or the, people, the powers that be at the current moment it is something that uh, becomes the most important and invaluable resources in times beyond our own right so three four years from now if you want to look back at what happened during these elections somebody who had been impartial becomes the most sort of prominent uh, source for what has happened. And that I tell you very much as an academic that that is what happens over and over again when we do uh, research in recent history. So, um, you know, hopefully uh, institutions and actors that see their incentives as longer term than the immediate ratings and so on and so forth come to the fore. And I think that does actually address some of the issues. 
Uh, that's actually a rather reassuring um, point to uh, to part with. And thank you. Thanks so much for that, Niranjan. Um, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani and uh, Niranjan. Thanks so much for being part of this panel discussion. Particularly, as I said, Mr. Uh, Venkat Ramani, you've finished a heavy day in court. Niranjan, you've joined us um, uh, from a different time zone altogether. So thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani, I have some very, very um, key points I'm taking away from what you've just spoken, particularly in the context of political parties. And That's one, yeah, one, sure. one goes back in, in memory lane to those days when one was looking at media reports and cases coming to as election disputes, booth capturing, right? Now mm -hmm. that looks like a that looks like an old man's tale today. Therefore, in your heading, whether the electoral politics and then electoral democracy is a is a, a spectacle and, and substance, I think. Today, to a large extent, it is not merely a spectacle, it is a substance. Electoral politics, role of election commission of India and the urge among a large number of people, large segment of our people, they, that every institution must be free and then as far as possible impartial are things which are emerging in a big way. We are not able to see them. On the one hand, we see yes, a lot of corrosion of ethical values. I can, my votes can be bought for money. Right, larger number of people can butter away those things, but I think at the at the bottom of it all, that one could still see a, an urge that this institution should be able to come up to a certain higher level of performance standards and ethical, you know, and, and norms. I could see that when because as a practicing law in Supreme Court and also coming across people from various parts of the country in a very informal way, we could feel that. I think it seems to be in the air. Only thing is, we need to catch all that in the air into a structured way and see if we can yes. make more sense out of what people want. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Venkat Ramani. That's, that's rather helpful. It's a very helpful thought to part with. And um, thank you so much for being here, Niranjan. Thank you so much. You've shared some very intriguing numbers with us. And I'm taking back a lot of, um, uh, quite a few pointers on my reading material on this issue after you, after having had this uh, conversation with you. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, thank you so much for to all our attendees also for taking out time and uh, attending this event. Uh, we also look forward to having you in uh, the other conversations that we have, as I mentioned at the beginning of this event, uh, this is going to be a monthly monthly series. Uh, we'll have one conversation per month and we have uh, several topics lined up for the months to come. Uh, so I really hope that uh, we can have you with us in the coming months as well. Please do keep an eye out on uh, Vidhi's as well as IIC social media channels so you can have uh, an idea when the event is happening and what topic it's going to be on. Um, thanks very much to IIC's uh, tech support team. Thank you so much for, for facilitating this discussion on StreamYard. Uh, thanks a lot, Tete, for, um, for making sure that everything goes on smoothly and for coordinating with me as well as our speakers. Thank you so much. Um, I hope to see all the attendees uh, in, the, uh, in our conversation next month. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank you. Nice meeting both of you. Yes, yes. Nice meeting both of you as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care, sir.